Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Esther Croco Show. Today I'm joined by Edwina Curry, author and former politician. She's best known for being junior health minister under Margaret Thatcher's government in the 1980s. Thank you so much for joining me, Edwina. Pleasure to be with you, Esther. So I wanted to start off by asking you firstly, why are you a conservative? Are you a small C conservative or, um, you know, a true blue conservative member? Well, I grew up in Liverpool in the years after the war, after the Second World War. The place was flattened uh, and I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish household. It was a long time before I realised that actually I grew up in a, a very traumatised place with people who uh, who were still uh, absolutely aghast and broken by the news that had come in from the Holocaust and relatives and families that we knew there. Yeah. And uh, that starts off with feeling a little bit um, insecure about governments that do things, right? So on the whole, prefer to be responsible for our own actions, uh, prefer to take um, our, our duties, our civic duties very seriously. But nonetheless, when governments say jump, we jump back a little bit. Huh? Um, yeah. <laughs> then uh, Liverpool, when I was growing up, was in the uh, grip of militant, the original uh, militant organisation, and it was Marxist, it was uh, deliberately setting out to destroy our economy, lots of strikes, uh, and as a result people moved away and the city lost population very dramatically. So I'm almost automatically being shifted from being anything left towards uh, very much being right of centre. Uh, broadly speaking, I would say I am an economic conservative, um, I don't like debt and I like us to pay our way and I'm a social liberal on the whole. I think uh, that discrimination, well, entirely, I think that discrimination is a bad thing. We shouldn't yeah. discriminate. We shouldn't allow our law to be discriminatory and we should give everybody the, the best possible chance, which includes education, but it also includes encouraging entrepreneurship and um, enabling people to achieve the fruits of their own hard work. So that's where I am. And what I found very quickly was that the Conservative Party has been a natural home and I've been a member for over 50 years. Oh, wow. OK. So, I mean, obviously, when you joined the Conservative Party, it was a completely different time um, to now. Obviously, you uh, served under Thatcher's government. What was it about the Conservative Party of Margaret Thatcher that resonated with you at the time? If you put her in context, it's easy to understand. Uh, the country was brought to its knees by not just incompetent Labour governments, but Labour governments that totally failed to curb the trade unions. And that meant that we were very much in the grip of people being guided and trained in, in Moscow who were determined to destroy our capitalist society and um, who wanted to see a revolution, a Marxist revolution. And um, everyone had got very fed up with this. It had become not just tiresome, but very dangerous. And that's how Margaret Thatcher got elected to the leadership of the party in 1975, when I was um, in my 20s. And in fact, I was elected that same year to Birmingham City Council as a very young councillor with a baby tucked under one arm. It was very yeah. unusual then. Yeah, I can imagine. But it was also why she got elected to power with a majority of over 40. Four years later, in 1979, the country was fed up to the back teeth with both the incompetence and the injustice and the economic damage uh, that was being done. And they wanted a different way of doing things. And they were prepared to give the little lady her chance. That was wonderful. And when I heard her speak, I went to the first party conference that she spoke at in 1975 as a young councillor. And she spoke about how the state should be the servant of the people, not its master. Yeah. And that we should do everything possible to keep socialism at bay. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, that's exactly right. How did she know what I think? And there were loads of us. I looked around and the whole place was on its feet and cheering. And I thought, we have a future. So, you know, how has politics changed since your time as an MP? Obviously, things have been completely different. We have a completely different relationship with the European Union, um, even before uh, Margaret Thatcher um, 
you know, left office and after and now and with Brexit and everything, things have completely, they look completely different. So, you know, how would you say that uh, politics has changed since, since your time as an MP? Uh, it, it's changed in some very obvious ways. When I came into the House of Commons, there were only 23 women yep. altogether. <laughs> that was uh, 1983. There were 10 Labour women, 13 Tory women, including me and the Prime Minister. Yeah. And um, it, it was a, a very patronising world, at the very least. I mean, the women who got there could look after themselves. But there was active discrimination against women, active discrimination against uh, black and ethnic minority groups. Uh, it was very difficult for anybody except a chap in a suit with a wife and two kids, uh, a white chap in a suit with a wife and two kids, and possibly with an on to his name, yeah. uh, to get selected uh, for a good seat. And that changed dramatically under Margaret. Uh, she, was, she was a natural a widener of, of uh, barriers. She was a, 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 an outsider herself. And so she encouraged other people who have been excluded from that very small group uh, to think that they could become MPs, people like myself. Uh, so Julian Critchley, who was in the Commons at the time, huffed that they had swapped, the Tories had swapped the military crosses and the Knights of the Shires for the used car salesmen and the estate agents. <laughs> wow, that's quite the analogy. He got it right. No, he, was, he was actually uh, a good guy. He had got it absolutely right. And um, that recognised that conservatism isn't, it, it, it isn't just part of one particular group. It's very widely held, particularly amongst the strivers in society, the people who run businesses, the people who own businesses and start businesses, um, the people who have to pay the taxes, uh, that, you know, get a certain amount of resentment then against the people who, like Richard Branson, who snuggle up to the Labour government and then go off to Neckar and won't pay taxes for 10 years and then come back yeah. to the British government and say, hey, I need a handout. Wow. Wow. Um, so the, the, there have been tremendous improvements in the, the way our country looks. And, um, you know, people like you and me are much more likely to be the face of politics. And it was extremely rare 30 years ago. So I'm delighted to see that because that then means that the House of Commons is much more representative of the country as a whole. And the current cabinet in particular, I think, is, is splendid. Uh, and it's lovely to see that when when British goodwill and British good heartedness has, has rescued people from appalling situations like Idi Amin's uh, Uganda, yeah. that people have been able to come as refugees, have made good and their families, their children and their grandchildren and then members of parliament. I think that's absolutely wonderful. That's, I think, the biggest change. Um, the other changes at the moment are very... They're like the continental shelves, they're shifting. And that's because the pandemic means that we yeah. don't quite know how we're going to come out of this, uh, what's going to fail, what's going to be successful, and what the pattern of the economy is going to look like over the next uh, few years. Um, think about Brexit. There's an element of nothing's changed, but everything's changed. Changed, yeah. Nothing's changed in the sense that uh, within a month of us talking together, we will have decided whether we're going for an extension or not. And I think the answer is no. Nope. We've all had enough of debate and argument. It can't be that difficult to get an agreement between uh, a nation and a group of nations that have been trading together successfully for the best part of half a century. Okay. It cannot be that difficult if the political will in Brussels is there. And yet everything has changed because the effect of the pandemic means that every economy in the world has taken a big hit and um, particularly in Europe which has been very badly hit uh, Italy Spain Germany as well and yeah. many of the countries so it could be that their leaders are saying to Brussels oh for heaven's sake just get a move on sign they're not coming back so sign yeah we shall see
We'll, we'll see how that is. Um, I, I, I'm a bit, you know, I have a bit of a, I'm a bit speculative about how strong the EU will be after this pandemic. Um, and obviously once the deal is signed, but that that's a conversation for another day. Um, you know, obviously there is a shift amongst young people in particular, um, over the last, I suppose, 10 years and the feeling of uh, alienation from the current Conservative Party. It's not uncommon to see young people, especially under 30, either gravitating more towards the left or voting for parties like, you know, Labour or more recently uh, Lib Dem, but definitely Labour. Why do you think young people feel more alienated from the Conservative Party? I think, uh, bear in mind, I, I have been young. And um, I was there and I was very active in politics in, in my day. I, I think there are probably a couple of elements there. Uh, one is that young people will tend almost naturally to be uh, suspicious of or antipathetic to the government, the establishment of the day. Yeah. When I was uh, growing up in the 1960s with Labour government uh, and indeed right through the 70s, you want to know what kind of Labour government go and watch something like James Graham's National Theatre play, This House. That was the kind of, of mess uh, that we had as a government, absolutely brilliant portrayal. Um, so well, young people are naturally very suspicious and that's right. And that's, that's a, a normal uh, pattern of behavior. And also young people, I think, want easy answers. It's only as you get older that you realize that compromises are important that pragmatism and what Boris calls common sense are actually an important part of the mix. They're not failure. Yeah. They are the way we live with reality. Uh, and I have a feeling that, that that urge for something pure has been exacerbated by the way a lot of politics is taught in universities. Um, there are a lot of Marxists teaching politics and economics in British universities. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had one back then. And I remember getting quite upset when she wanted me to do E.P. Thompson's The Making of the Working Class, which I think is now recognised by economic historians as a very partial book. And I wanted to study the life of Disraeli. And uh, she was quite stroppy about it. And I thought, if I cross her, I could find that my marks are marked down and that reduces the quality of my degree. She is in a position to bully me. Yes. Yeah. So I went and talked to somebody else about it who happened to be a Tory councillor and was also a teacher and tutor at the university. And he said, I can teach you. I can teach you. You just go in and tell the principal that you want me to teach you and you can come to Merton and we can go and have tea in Merton afterwards. And that's what happened. And I learned then that you should never give in to bullying. And that's a message I would give to a lot of students. If you don't like what your tutor is teaching you, challenge it, keep a record of the challenge, and then go, then go and get some help. And it may well be that you're right, your tutor is wrong, and that you can get better teaching from someone else. Definitely stand your ground. I think that's that's definitely a very valuable uh, lesson to teach a lot of young people that feel intimidated um, by lecturers that seem to have all the power um, these days. Um, obviously, before this COVID-19 plague hit the world, the big news story that was coming out of the UK was obviously Brexit and handling negotiations. You know, we were still in the country was just frustrated whether you voted to leave or remain that we would voted um, in 2016 in a democratic uh, sort of referendum. The, the public had given a mandate to leave. And three years on, we just we, we were still in sort of a deadlock. How do you think uh, personally the Conservative Party handled uh, the issue of the Brexit vote from the time that we did vote to, I suppose, when Boris finally got uh, things moving uh, uh, bearing in mind of course we're now out uh, yeah january the 31st meant we are out we are in a transition period uh, as far as trade is concerned partly because legislation's got to go through uh, to enable us to um, look after the countryside and a whole host of other issues uh, but uh, it was it was tough i i take your view entirely esther I was a campaigner for Remain. I had stood for the European Parliament in 1994. I loved the idea that instead of the, what Churchill called the charnel house of Europe, a Europe destroyed by war, that we could build a better Europe. And indeed, he had been actively encouraging the formation of what he called the United States of Europe. 
the difference was that he thought that Britain would be superior to all that. And Britain had an empire and we didn't need to take part in anything like that. Um, you know, within 10 years, we'd have nothing in terms of an empire. And it was important to take a different approach. And very quickly, people were saying that we had to join the growing uh, European economic community. And it was a conservative government. It was Ted Heath's government that, the got us, uh, that first got us in. And Margaret Thatcher was very supportive, not least because she could see the benefits of a huge free trade yeah. area. That was, that was all great. But the romantic stuff kind of faded away. And the, in, in Brussels, there came about a kind of empire building based entirely on politics and based on a kind of Roman law politics, if you do what I say. At which point hackles start to come up on every British neck. Mm, who do you think you are to tell us what to do? And this is particularly affecting the European Council, who, of course, the civil servants. And in Britain, there's a very clear hierarchy with the ministers at the top and civil servants. Um, uh, well done uh, in that pecking order. It isn't the same in many European countries. And that's because the civil servants, because of the war, because of fascism, they are better trusted than elected politicians. So we're actually coming at it from different cultural patterns. So the referendum was called and uh, from the remainder's viewpoint, it was lost. But then David Cameron resigned. And I think that was a great, great pity because he is smart enough and wily enough, if you like, enough of a politician uh, to be able to carry forward something that he perhaps hadn't promoted, uh, but he could, uh, he could have um, uh, pushed forward in, in the British interest. And he's gone, he's gone completely. Yeah. Theresa took over and I had every hope, but she turned out to be not sure-footed, but a bit leaden-footed. With the best will in the world, uh, she accepted the, the agenda that Brussels was promoting. And instead of talking about trade first and everything else afterwards, it was citizenship first and all that sort of thing. And um, when she lost our majority, uh, we were in an extremely weak position. Yeah. Don't want to live through those couple of years from 2017 to 2019 again it was horrible i mean this year has not been a great improvement yeah i mean the last year, oh you know 2020 has kind of it's, it's done its damage for sure well it's it was and you can look back and you can see what went wrong yeah i, I attribute to Theresa may the highest of motives she's a good and decent woman but there are some senses esther in which i would now say mm, uh, you can be good, you can be decent, but you could actually fail. And that um, actually, you know, Boris is a rogue. Um, so yeah. is Churchill in his own way. So is Disraeli. But they got things done. Yeah. And um, if I have to choose between a saint and a sinner, um, between somebody who's going to go round in circles and someone who's going to drive Get through the, the job world, done. Yeah. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so, you know, what do you think the future of Brexit is, in your opinion? What, what direction do you think we're going in? By the end of the year, where do you think this whole situation will be? They, what we were hoping before the pandemic um, has had to be modified. There's no doubt about that. Um, what I could see before the pandemic, before anybody thought that we were going to have these extraordinary global problems, uh, was that we would push hard for uh, big global trade. I mean, it is already the case that we do more trade outside the EU than we do with the EU. And it's also the case that our trade with the EU is more one way of them selling stuff to us than vice versa. On the other hand, an awful lot of that was dependent on cars and the car industry for completely separate reasons to do with the development of electric cars and so on. And um, uh, the uh, diesel gate has been completely tossed in the air. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I have an example here of the, the two extremes, if you like. I've got a Tesla car uh, and the other car in the drive is a Skoda diesel, which, of course, is a Volkswagen. Yeah. One of them has seen its value go up and the other seen its value go, go down. <laughs> so that was what we were hoping, that we would be kind of almost freebooting free traders, taking advantage of the growth of the world 
outside the EU, trading freely with China, with America, and uh, selling our expertise and our goods and our services, our banking and so on to the world. Now, that depends on international travel. It depends on people being able to move freely. It's still the case that goods can move freely, but an awful lot of that depends on somebody taking wing and flying out to uh, wherever they want to do business and talking to the individuals there and talking to the companies. Uh, and this. You can't sell at a distance. To yeah. sell, you have to go face to face. So the quicker we can sort out the issues of quarantine, shielding, uh, lack of passenger transport, what's happening to Gatwick, what's happening to British Airways, these are not marginal issues. They are central to making sure that Brexit works. I have enough faith in the ingenuity and the energy and the entrepreneurship of the average British business person to have a lot of faith that this will come out OK in the end. I was hoping within five years with the COVID crisis, it might take a little bit longer, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Definitely. Um, and, you know, I, I, I recently uh, spoke to Simon Dolan, who's obviously a very well-known uh, entrepreneur and British, British businessman, and he's suing the government over the legality of the lockdown. Um, what, what, what do you make of that? You know, because the, the argument here is if the government can effectively lock down an entire society and we don't have any precedents for this, we don't really have a constitution that says, you know, OK, you're allowed to do that, but not this. What do you think the legality of this lockdown is then? Well, I think Simon's going to be spending a lot of money on lawyers who will say to him, oh, yes, this is a wonderful case. Absolutely wonderful. You'll be all over the front pages and rubbing their hands with three. There's one profession that isn't going to be short of money, whatever happens. <clears throat> right. <laughs> and no, I think he's making a mistake. I think the lockdown was in everybody's interest. I can see why he wants to argue that. But he would be better advised, I think, to focus his attention on making sure that his business or businesses survive and that we get our figures of deaths and cases to zero as quickly as possible. Now, people who complain about the lockdown are not helping with that because they give they they give the idea to weaker minds than theirs, indeed, and that uh, it's all right to ignore social distancing. Uh, I had an email from one of my daughters who lives in London uh, saying uh, she wanted to go on the march against um, what's been happening in America, Black Lives Matter march. But she was worried about social distancing. And I'm thinking, uh, right, OK, they won't miss you if you don't go on the march. Um, but you might come home with a bug. With a bug. Yeah. With a bug. And is that great? Is that a good good thing to be doing? She uh, is a church member. She works with homeless people. She works with people who need her. Do you yeah. see what I mean? And when somebody like Simon says, oh, the lockdown wasn't necessary or is doing a lot of damage, we might agree eventually, but we're not going to waste energy on that because we just end up seeing an awful lot of people putting themselves and the people within a metre of them at serious risk. Okay. And, you know, it's funny you should mention um, your daughter wanted to go to the uh, march um, that's uh, sort of bringing to light the issues of police brutality um, in the US. Um, one of the one of my main criticisms for that is because I feel like there's been a lot of manipulation of media and a lot of manipulation of the rhetoric. Um, and I still stand by the fact that I don't believe that the US and the West are fundamentally racist societies, at least not in 2020. Um, but, you know, I have there It's been quite a heated debate and there's always there's obviously a lot of passion in that debate. Do you do you fundamentally think that the West or most Western societies are fundamentally racist? I don't, actually. I, that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Uh, it certainly doesn't make sense when you look at how many countries in Europe have taken in people uh, as refugees or as economic migrants from countries all over the world. Uh, certainly in the UK, we still have net quarter of a million people coming in to settle every year. Certainly last year, we can't travel at the moment. Um, and lots of people from Britain go and live and work abroad and are treated extremely well. And that doesn't accord with any of the experience I have. I live near Manchester. 
um, spent 11 years on Birmingham City Council. You get little pockets of it. Very, very multi-ethnic um, cities. Well, they're very mixed cities and yep. they're vibrant cities, partly because they have brains and energy, <laughs> work ethic and drive, yep. and ambition coming in from all over the world um, with people adapting very, very quickly. Uh, and that I think that's wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I saw a figure recently that 40 percent of people in London at the last census, census in 2011 identified as uh, black or ethnic minorities. Wow, that is amazing. That's so different in many ways from the way the United Kingdom was when I was uh, growing up as a young person. I welcome that. I think it's part of the vibrancy of this of this country. Change makes things happen. Yeah. Right. It, it's not the other way around. It's not that things happen and then you have change. Change itself, economic um, economic shocks, economic shifts make things happen and give opportunities that didn't exist before. Now, in America, first of all, it's a huge country, physically and in terms of its population. And it always seems to me wrong to lump everybody together with any slogan in the States. But very broadly speaking, it's a more violent society yeah. uh, than the United Kingdom. That's not so true of New York, where they got that under control. And there are a lot more guns around, even though big efforts are made in some states to get that under control. And of course, if you have violence and guns, you're going to get somebody hurt. Yeah. They also seem to condone and to allow methods of restricting prisoners and people under arrest and suspects that we would absolutely not allow. Yeah. We've learned, often the hard way, that if you are uh, trying to arrest somebody who is aggressive or who may be intoxicated or who may be ill, so for example, sickle cell anemia attacks may look like someone is drunk yeah. and not. And if you don't look after them, they will die. Um, and that you get an element of class as well in there and you mix all that together and you put a little bit of extra anti-racial feeling in, and you've got something that really is toxic. Now, really is what, toxic. We've done, what we've done in Britain is create uh, independent police um, inquiry systems so that the moment somebody dies in custody, the moment there is a complaint, the, that police force refer themselves automatically, and there is automatically uh, an inquiry. And that has taught us a great deal about handling people better and making sure that they're safe in police custody. And I'm married to a police officer, a former police officer. Um, so it's, it, it, these are very important issues and not, you're right, it, it's wrong to sloganise about them. Yeah. It, it, it lumps everyone together and it is, uh, it then is antithetical to thought. You have to think about what it is. A problem yeah. like that in New York City is not the same as a problem like that in Atlanta or a problem like that in Mississippi. In Montana or somewhere like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think I was reading, um, obviously, about the, the training of police force in the US and, you know, how civilians can, I guess, redress grievances with regard to treatment and handling and all of that sort of stuff. And apparently only 19% of police forces have the adequate resources for civilians to complain about their treatment. That That's a fifth of police forces these are people that are armed these are people that are trained um supposedly whether it's inadequate that's a conversation for another day but these are people that are carrying guns you know running into a policeman can be the the dif difference between life and death in the u.s so i think the fact that um you know independent inquiry and the fact that they they receive so much legal immunity effectively from each other from like the sort of uh, club that they've developed amongst themselves or from the legal system overall it that that is a recipe for disaster and whether people want to see it as a racial issue um, because obviously the last strings of uh, deaths that we we witnessed were black young men or whether they want to see it as an overarching issue or the fact that the, they are members of the police force that are acting like criminal gangs um you know that that's something that, that needs to be decided 
divided amongst the relevant people. But I definitely think, you know, what you mentioned about the fact that a lot of police forces in the UK are effectively on check because no matter what happens, their actions can be scrutinised. Um, that's something that's um, definitely important for the US. And I think that that goes a long way in debunking this idea that the West is just systematically racist. You know, these are nuanced well, discussions. I, 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 well, I, I agree. Um, but I think it's always helpful to step back and think as well. You know, everybody was filming what was going on on their phones. Yes. They were actually filming a man dying for what was yeah. it? They never stopped, stepped in. There were far more of them than there were of these police officers. They might not have been armed. You know, all the police officers standing there were definitely armed. You know, it's, it's, it's so unfortunate that someone, you know, the, 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 the extent of legal immunity has fostered this culture of kind of bravado well, and fearlessness. Uh, 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 wait, wait. You are making assumptions. <laughs> you are making a whole range of assumptions now. Okay. We, uh, we we have no, we do not have that information. Uh, plus, that's a very broad generalization. You know, it it it's worth pointing out that in in most countries in the world, the police are armed. Yeah. We think of it like that as being dangerous because the United Kingdom is quite unique in in many ways. The police are not armed. They're not routinely armed. And we don't like it when they are armed and then there is a problem and they shoot somebody, even if they are very much um, uh, on the defensive and they're worried that that person might shoot them. Um, my husband used to have um, a, an armed certificate as a senior detective in the Met. And um, his, his job was sorting out organised crime, which meant that, that he often came face to face with people that were armed. And he said that um, on one particular occasion, chasing a robber. Robert turned round, picked out a sawn-off shotgun from his coat, aimed it at my husband, and before he could shoot, my husband went and parted his hair. Oh, wow. Actually, that's a disciplinary offence, because if you shoot at somebody, you are supposed to shoot them dead, all right? Because the, the people around them, that, that, that's the training that they have. Really? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you are certainly, I mean, he was regarded as having, you know, wonderful eyesight and a brilliant shot because he parted the guy's hair and they yeah. caught him and he went down for over 20 years. Uh, but my husband's uh, response to that is, no, 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 no. I should have shot him dead. That was what I was supposed to do. I didn't. And he went into the office the next day and handed in his firearms license and said, I don't want to be put in that position ever again. And he never carried a weapon again. I said, well, what happened when you met other arm robbers? He said, oh, I just talked to them. <laughs> <laughs> Heavens above. Um, so let's not forget the bravery of a lot of... Yeah, officers. a lot of police officers. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll say this, to, to any groups that are campaigning or demonstrating or whatever, um, Killer Mike the Rapper said the right thing the other night on Saturday night when he said, if you burn down your house, all you're left with is ashes. Yeah. That's not good. What you need to do is what John Stuart Mill in the 19th century told us to do. If you want power, it's all about political power. You have to be able to stand for parliament. You have to be able to vote. You have to use that vote. You have to be prepared to work out a better way of doing things and then get it through legislation, change attitudes as you're doing it, and then you will have the better world that you hope for. Definitely. I, I think that's, that's a, a saner route as well, instead of, you know, looting sure. and rising. Yeah. OK, so one last question, Edwina. What would your message be to young people that are either just getting started in politics, getting interested, don't really have a political home? What would your message be to young people today? Uh, it's the same message that I've given for many, many years. Number one, get the best education you can. And it almost doesn't matter what it is, but the more widely you read, uh, the more thoroughly you study. And books are more important than the Internet, because with a book, you have to think about it. You have to figure it out. Uh, you may have to go back and read that bit again. Uh, I would recommend biographies, histories. I would recommend science so that you know what you might be dealing with. Um, and I would say to you, keep your curiosity at all stages very much in the forefront of your mind. At the moment you think I'm right, and they're wrong, uh, is the point at which you stop learning and then you stop being um, you stop being as good as you could be. Let's put it like that. 
yeah. if you're genuinely interested at uh, say university level in your 20s uh, about going into politics then on behalf of the entire british nation can i please ask you to do something else for 10 years <laughs> all right if you're still interested 10 years on a whole host of things hopefully will have happened um you will have matured you will have learned a lot more than you knew in your 20s you will have possibly found your life partner you may certainly have developed a career and an ability to earn money away from politics which will really stand you in good stead because it's a very flighty profession oh, in and out in no time at all um you will have contacts and grounding outside politics which you will be able to draw on a, a really useful patterns of friends and a family who will support you and that will make life bearable for you when politics goes sour as it does from time oh, to time oh, and yeah. enable you to pick yourself up uh, the, the people that seem to do very well who hit the ground running read politics at university um, work as interns for an MP, get themselves a seat, and are in Parliament and on the front benches before they're 30. And then this is a big crisis, like the one we're living through now, yeah. and they're lost. They're lost. They have no hinterland. They have nothing to fall back on. And you always, you to, to, to stay a sane human being, which means a better MP, you have to do that. If you decide by the time you're 30, that actually going into Parliament is not for you, that you prefer to run your business, whatever it is, you prefer to uh, become the head teacher at this school, you prefer to progress in whatever profession, then fine. But it does mean then that you can help. You can get involved in party politics, you can help, you can deliver leaflets, and you can make sure that whichever professional activity you're in isn't taken over by Marxists, leftists, uh, anarchists, and other idiots. Is that clear? <laughs> I wish I could write that down and like put it on like a, a, a I don't know like a banner or something. That's such good <laughs> advice, such sound advice. Thank you so much, Edwina. It's been such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for coming. It's my pleasure. It's my honour, and good luck to everyone. Thank you. I would say if you're not happy with the way you're being taught, if you're not happy with the way the student union is run, if you're not happy with no platforming. No, you're probably right. And I mean that both ways. Um, it probably means that you're more right wing than the people that you're criticising. And it also means that you're probably on the side of the angels. Uh, the thing to do is figure out with other people of like mind how to go about changing it. I mean, for example, stand for election in the student union. You may not win it. But the fact that there are plenty of people quietly who will support you and will cast their votes for you may get the Marxists at the top to change their tune. They're all going to end up as Labour ministers one day, sooner or later. Anyway, they don't think so now, but they will. Um, and take every opportunity that you can to express your views. So a blog, meetings, um, make sure that your local MP, your con local Conservative MP, uh, has your number in speed dial and that way you can go and help them you can get advice you can get mentoring which is never never underestimate the value of having an older person around that can say well I did that or I didn't do that and this is how I would go forward occasionally you stick your neck out and you risk being yelled at and this is where having good family and good friends matters so yeah. if you see nasty stuff, racism, anti-Semitism or whatever. Do not walk past. Make sure it's recorded and make sure that whoever is responsible is brought to book. We live in a free country. We're very lucky to be able to do that. And its freedom has been hard fought and hard won over many centuries, including in our own. So I would say to you, you're part of that battle. Whatever weapons you use, but the best weapons that you've got are your brain, your heart, and your mouth. <laughs>